The top stories tonight in Y News. Death toll from Typhoon Rolly rises to 16 as it affects 2 million people in 12 regions. Bicol provinces still suffer massive brownouts and disconnected communication lines in the height of Typhoon Rolly. President Rodrigo Duterte personally visits areas hardest hit by Tropical Storm Rolly. The Philippine Coast Guard deploys choppers and transmitters over severely typhoon-hit Catanduanes. Two days before the presidential elections, U.S. President Donald Trump cast doubt on the integrity of prolonged vote count. And new drone technology improves ability to forecast volcanic eruptions. Good evening, Philippines and the world. Today is Monday, November 2, 2020. I am Harleen Delgado. Join us in the next hour as we deliver today's top stories around the country and in other parts of the world. I'm Angelo Castro III. We are also seen in 1,935 satellite monitoring centers nationwide and via live streaming worldwide through the UNTV News and Rescue social media accounts and our website, untvweb.com. I am William Theo. Power consumers in the path of Typhoon Rolly are still in the dark due to massive brownouts triggered by damage to power facilities. Kat Dumaraos will tell us why. A day after Super Typhoon Rolly pummeled the Bicol region, the Department of Energy reported that consumers in the provinces of Albay, Camarines Norte, Camarines Sur, Sorsogon, and Catanduanes are still agonizing from total blackouts. In a briefing of the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council, or NDRRMC, Energy Undersecretary Alexander Lopez indicated that as of late, the whole of Bicol region still has no electricity. Lopez noted that a total of 2,776 megawatts had been taken out from the system as the power plant owners and operators resorted to preemptive actions. The electric generating facilities which went on emergency shutdown had been the Tiwi Geothermal Power Plant, Bakon Manito Geothermal Power Plant, Makiling Banahaw Geothermal Plant, Iligan Gas-Fired Power Facility, Santa Rita Gas-Fired Power Plant, and the San Lorenzo Gas-Fired Power Generating Facility. The power plants on restoration activities as of November 2nd had been the Southwest Luzon Power Generation Corporation, Avion Gas Plant, and the Pagbilao Coal Fired Power Plant. In Catanduanes, the energy official noted that disconnected communication lines in the province had been rendering power restoration efforts doubly difficult to carry out. With this, Department of Interior and Local Government Secretary Eduardo Año stressed the urgency of improving communication lines to facilitate the delivery of appropriate assistance to the distressed local government units during disasters. Año has strongly pushed for the revival of the radio communication systems aside from the satellite communication lines. Yan ang improve natin kung paano tayo magkakaroon ng tuloy-tuloy na communication Kahit na wala na ang uh, halimbawa ang uh, telephone signal, uh, meron pa rin dapat no? ang, ang uh, radio uh, communication na isa sa dapat natin i-revive no? bukod sa satellite communication. Authorities cannot give a categorical time frame yet on when the power will be fully restored in Bicol. Kat Dumaraos, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. Typhoon Rolly has killed 16 persons and affected 2 million people, according to the Office of the Civil Defense. Meanwhile, the initial damage brought by typhoon, by the typhoon to the agriculture sector was estimated at 1.1 billion pesos. Live from the UNTV mobile radio booth, Harleen Delgado will tell us why live. Harleen, go ahead. 
Yes, Jago, the Office of the Civil Defense in Bicol Region has reported 16 deaths due to Super Typhoon Rolly. Based on its report released to the media, of the 16 fatalities, 10 are from Albay, while 6 are from Catanduanes, while 3 are still missing in Albay. However, the NDRRMC is still verifying the report. Based on the NDRRMC's official tally, as of 11 a.m., 11 people died while two are reported injured in Calabarzon and Bicol region due to the onslaught of Typhoon Rolly. In today's briefing with cabinet officials, NDRRMC Executive Director Ricardo Halad said over 327,000 families or more than 2 million individuals have been affected by the typhoon. Meanwhile, the initial damage to agriculture was estimated at 1.1 billion pesos, affecting 20,000 farmers of rice, corn, and high-value crops. According to Agriculture Secretary William Dar, the agency has 400 million peso quick response fund for the rehabilitation of affected regions. The NDRRMC's assessment on the cost of damages is still ongoing. Meanwhile, Catanduanes Governor Joseph Cua said that the infrastructure damages in the province is estimated at 700 million to 1 billion pesos. He adds damage to abaca, which is the province's main product, is also estimated at 400 million pesos and and another 200 million pesos for other crops. Approximately 15,000 families were affected by the typhoon, while 10,000 small houses, particularly those along the coastal areas, were totally damaged. The governor is appealing for help, especially on additional relief items, drinking water, and repair materials for houses. Kung pwede sana ma mapapagura natin yung mga telco company na ma-establish ma kaagad o ma-restore kaagad ang uh, uh, telecommunication para magkaroon ng contact kami sa signal sa pamilya ng mga taga-katanduanes dyan sa Manila o sa abroad. Gusto kong ipalam na hindi kami possible sa ngayon. No? Yung 11 towns ko hindi possible. So talagang kailangan na kailangan namin ang tulong ng national under Secretary Holland Sound, a military aircraft ferrying food packs and potable water will be sent to Catanduanes tomorrow. Meanwhile, 90% of infrastructures in Catanduanes province have been damaged by the previous Super Typhoon Roli, the world's strongest storm so far this year, according to the Philippine National Police. PNP Deputy Chief for Operations Lieutenant General Cesar Hawthorne Binag revealed citing information from Bicol Region Police Chief Brigadier General Bartolome Bustamante. Binag, however, said this was only the assessment of the police. He added that PNP Chief General Camilo Cascolan is also set to travel to Bicol to assess the search and rescue operations being done by the police in support of regional and local disaster risk reduction and management councils. Central Visayas Police Chief Brigadier General Albert Ignatius Ferrero Ferro has also earlier said 100 police officers from Police Regional Office 7 are set to be deployed in Bicol Region hopefully tomorrow to augment the forces of Police Regional Office 5 and help in response efforts following the onslaught of the typhoon. Two choppers from the Philippine Coast Guard have been deployed to assist in the conduct of damage assessment in the province of Catanduanes that was badly hit by Typhoon Roli. Victor Cosare reports why. The Philippine Coast Guard said it has sent two Airbus light twin-engine helicopters to support the damage assessment as well as emergency response operations being conducted by the Office of the Civil Defense. The Coast Guard Aviation Force's BN Islander plane has also been dispatched Monday morning to render necessary assistance to the typhoon-ravaged province, the agency said. The team will also pinpoint hot spots that would need immediate rescue and relief missions, it added. 
Aerial photos and videos taken by the PCG showed the damage caused by the typhoon in Catanduanes. The Virac Airport in the province also appeared to have sustained heavy damages with debris strewn around the facility after the onslaught of Raleigh based on photos posted by the PCG on its social media account. Aside from the deployment of its aerial assets, the Coast Guard said it also sent doctors and communications personnel with high-frequency radios and portable transmitters to enhance telecommunications service in Catanduanes. With the arrival of first responders, the PCG assures the people of Catanduanes that help is on its way as he implored Coast Guard personnel to extend all efforts to provide necessary assistance to most affected residents. Victor Cosare, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. President Rodrigo Duterte has expressed high praises for all government agencies for their effective response to Typhoon Roli. Meanwhile, the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council defends the president's absence in the high-level briefing of government agencies on Typhoon Roli as the hashtag Nasan Ang Pangulo goes trending. Rosalie Coates explains why. Malacanang said President Rodrigo Duterte commenced the preparations and response of local government as well as various government agencies regarding Typhoon Roli. The preparations lessened the impact caused by the calamity. The Duterte administration also lauds the efforts of local government units, including in Metro Manila, though the capital is not severely affected by Typhoon Roli. Tingin ko po ang paningin ng presidente, he would like to commend uh, all uh, local government units, all uh, departments and agencies of government dahil uh, napakita naman po natin na dahil sa ating kahandaan, eh, nabawasan po natin yung abiria. Maganda ang performance ng ating LGUs. No? Uh, as early as uh, October 30, nagsisimula na tayo ng force evacuation. In fact, kahit sa... Uh, lugar na kung saan lumilis ang bagyo, katulad ng NCR, ay uh, tuloy ang kanilang evacuation. According to Roque, the government will continue to aim for zero casualties in future calamities. Meanwhile, the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council, or NDRRMC Executive Director, defended the absence of the President during the public briefing on Typhoon Rolly. This after hashtag Nasaan ang Pangulo trended on Twitter yesterday as Typhoon Rolly hit several parts of the country. Undersecretary Ricardo Halad said the public has nothing to worry about it. Uh, dapat hindi... Mangamba yung ating mga kababayan, bakit uh, uh, hindi nila nakikita si Presidente? Because he has that luxury. The, the government is functioning from the local government unit up to the national level. Earlier, Secretary Harry Roque cleared that the President was monitoring the government's response to the situation from Davao City. Roque said the President had instructed the military to assist in disaster response efforts and also appealed for bayanihan among vendors of basic goods while directing the Department of Trade and Industry to make sure that suggested retail prices were observed. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. President Rodrigo Duterte visits Ginobatan Albay to meet residents severely affected by Super Typhoon Rolly. Rosalie Cause has the details to tell us why live. Yes, Rosalie. Harleen, a day after Typhoon Rolly hit the Bicol region, President Rodrigo Duterte from Davao City visited uh, Ginobatan Town proper in Albay, one of the severely hit areas in the province. The chief executive meets with the, with the residents affected by the calamity. He assures assistance for them from the government. The president also instructed concerned agencies to conduct an investigation on alleged wiring operations in the area that residents complained about. President Duterte also conducted an aerial inspection of areas hardest hit by Typhoon Rolly, particularly in Catanduanes and Albay. The president returned to Malacanang from Davao City where he monitored the situation on Typhoon Rolly yesterday and ensured that government agencies work to provide immediate assistance for affected residents. 
He instructed various government agencies to provide immediate aid to affected communities. Meanwhile, Harleen, upon arrival in Malacanya, President Duterte leads a situational briefing with cabinet officials today at past five in the afternoon. He lets various cabinet members and other government officials to report on their response to typhoon-affected communities. On the quarrying operations ordered by the President to be investigated in Ginubatan Albay, Environment Secretary Roy Simatu said that he already directed the suspension of 11 to 12 operators as well as all quarrying operations around Mayot Volcano. In the latter part of the briefing, President Duterte mentioned various names of PhilHealth, immigration and customs officials and personnel suspended and being investigated for various corruption allegations. Harleen? Thank you so much, Rosalie Koz, for that report. Meanwhile, the Department of Science and Technology, or DOST, sees the need for the establishment of a Department of Disaster Resilience that will help the country mitigate the devastating effects of natural disasters. But a senator has expressed doubts on the practicality of creating it. Ray Pelayo will tell us why. Around 20 tropical cyclones enter the Philippine Area of Responsibility annually, wherein 8 to 9 of these directly affect the country. DOST Undersecretary Renato Solidum said the global warming makes cyclones stronger. Ang pagkain ng bagyo ay mainit na temperatura. Lumalakas ang bagyo habang meron kang mga mainit na plague. Raleigh is being compared to the track of Typhoon Rosita that also made landfall over Catanduanes 25 years ago. But Raleigh is stronger and did not directly hit Metro Manila. Raleigh's strength is a bit closer than Yolanda that devastated the country in 2013. Ang difference lang si Yolanda, all throughout its passage sa central part ng Philippines, ay halos na maintain niya yung kanyang super typhoon intensity at uh, humina na lamang siya sa may West Philippine Sea. Ito nga si uh, Rolly ay uh, pagka landfall and after land interaction dyan sa may Bicol and Southern Luzon area ay uh, humina na siya at uh, medyo mas mabagal yung kanyang pagkilos. The onslaught of Typhoon Rolly has triggered lahar mud flows and volcanic rocks as big as a house, killing three people and burying hundreds of houses in Barangay San Francisco in Ginubatan Albay were also seen. Yusek Saludum said this event is also possible in Mount Pinatubo. So maraming posibleng mangyari. Um, Pwedeng ang isip eh, dito muna sa ilog dadaan ang mga unang bahagi ng lahar. Pero pag napuno yan, pwede na siyang lumukso. The Department of Science and Technology is supporting the establishment of the Department of Disaster Resilience. Solidum said this will focus on how to mitigate the impact of disaster and help recovery for affected areas. Dapat may tumatahit at nagpapadaloy or facilitator o hindi kaya ay nangunguna. At ito po ang mangyayari kapag na-establish yung Department of Disaster Syrians. Senator Panfilo Lacson, meanwhile, said that while the House of Representatives deems it necessary to push the single agency, it will undoubtedly be another financial burden for the government. Lacson said he believes a dedicated office under the Office of the President with the cabinet rank and full authority to mobilize concerned government agencies before, during, and after calamities would do the job with much less funding and minimum number of staff and personnel. Ray Pilayo, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. President Rodrigo Duterte designates National Task Force against COVID-19 Chief Implementer Secretary Carlito Galvez Jr. as the country's vaccine czar. President Duterte himself announced this during a televised meeting with the government's key officials. The chief executive noted he wants a single line of authority when it comes to the purchase of the expected vaccine against COVID-19. He reiterates he has great faith in the secretary to come up with the solutions for the problem. The Department of Health, or DOH, reminded residents to follow the health protocols inside the evacuation area. 
The DOH further recommended testing all evacuees for COVID-19 before they go back to their respective communities. Aiko Miguel will tell us why. As thousands of families are now staying in the evacuation centers, the health department reminded local government units to at least have one family per modular tent in the evacuation area. This, according to the DOH, can prevent virus transmission like COVID-19. Ngayon, katulad nung sinasabi nyo na nagkaroon ng mga instances na nagsasama na kahit hindi na sila magkakapamilya, ang atin nga pong pinapaalala, di ba, that they should uh, have that uh, meron silang mask lahat, may safety officer na tumitingin sa, sa kanila regularly so that we can uh, be able to monitor kung meron magkakasimptomas. Evacuees are not prohibited to go out of their tents as long as they will not gather in one place and still maintain physical distancing. Advice din namin, do not stay the whole day inside that tent. No, try to just uh, go out and have uh, yun pong air. No, kasi enclosed din yung modular tents na yan. Mahirap din po na palagi ang nasa loob. Mas uh, mas hindi po healthy sa ating mga kababayan. The DOH also aims to have evacuees undergo COVID-19 testing, but this is not ideal now, according to the DOH. This is why the DOH advises LGUs to have evacuees undergo symptom screening and strictly implement health protocols like wearing a face mask and physical distancing. According to the health department, symptom screening should also be done before evacuees are allowed to return to their respective homes. This is to assure that they will not be spreaders or carriers of COVID-19 in their communities. We need, really need to have our Barangay Health Emergency Response Teams na mamobilize at uh, sila po talaga ay makapag-monitor ng mga tao kapag kabalik nila sa kanilang mga komunidad. So, symptom screening is our uh, recommended uh, way for now. Ay Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. The Marikina City local government will deploy health and safety protocol officers and evacuation centers as part of its disaster preparedness measures. Vincent Arboleda details why. The Marikina local government has implemented changes on their disaster preparedness measures. Marikina Mayor Marcelino Chodoro said that for every evacuation center, Five personnel will be deployed to ensure evacuees are practicing physical distancing, wearing face masks, and observing other minimum health safety protocols. Yung uh, team will be headed by by doctors. Uh, tapos yung uh, ilang administrative uh, function naman ay mga non-medical na ang uh, gagawa nito. Body temperature will also be checked to ensure evacuees are not exhibiting symptoms of the coronavirus disease. Chodoro said evacuees will immediately be isolated in another facility. The clinical evaluation sila at uh, pag kinakailangan, dadalhin sila sa quarantine facilities natin. There will also be separate rooms for senior citizens, breastfeeding mothers, and persons with disabilities. Medical rooms are also installed in every evacuation center. Chodoro said they implemented the new template for disaster preparedness measures on Sunday. As of Monday morning, over 500 evacuees already returned to their homes. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. The Department of Foreign Affairs, or DFA, recorded no new infections of coronavirus disease among Filipinos abroad on Sunday. This means the number of COVID-19 positive cases among overseas Filipinos remains at 11,244. Likewise, no new recoveries and fatalities were recorded, according to the DFA. To date, the total number of recoveries among overseas Filipinos is at 7,000. 1,279 and fatalities at 817. A total of 3,148 are currently being treated. Majority of the active cases, which totaled 2,306, are from the Middle East and Africa, while 510 others are in the Asia-Pacific region, 176 from Europe, and 156 from the Americas. The DFA vows to continuously monitor Monitor the situation of overseas Filipinos who were affected by the pandemic and remain steadfast in promoting and protecting their welfare.
Meanwhile, cases of coronavirus disease in the Philippines grew to 8, 385,400 after 2,298 new cases were reported today. The death toll rose to 7,269 with 32 new recorded fatalities, while there were also 87 new recoveries, bringing the national recovery count to 348,830. The latest case bulletin also showed that Benguet recorded the highest number of new confirmed cases with 188, followed by Davao City with 166, Rizal with 100. 119, Kazan City with 116, and Bulacan with 91. Typhoon Rolly has spared the 500-meter Dolomite Beach along Manila Bay from being washed out further. Dante Amento tells us why. Manila City had not experienced heavy rains during the Typhoon Rolly's onslaught in some parts of the country, and no storm surge that reportedly occurred and major thoroughfares were possible. Thus, even the Dolomite Sand or White Sand Beach in Manila Bay area was not affected by the weather disturbance. Fallen trees along Rojas Boulevard and other areas were immediately cleared by the Department of Public Services early in the morning. Yung mga nireport ninyo, mga puno, na ako naman na nagikayat sa inyo, uh, siya na po ang pinagtatanggal, as you can see, no? Uh, in the middle of this uh, typhoon, uh, nasa kalsada ang ating mga dedikadong kawani ng pamalan. Meanwhile, a total of 1,008 families or more than 4,000 individuals had already returned to homes from the evacuation centers. Sa awa naman ng Diyos, uh, paya pa silang nakatulog ng mahimbi dahil nga may, maayos naman na kanilang kinalalagyan. Kumpara doon sa kung hindi sila inilikas at binabayo sila ng malakas na hangin at ulan. The local government has distributed some food boxes before they were allowed to left the evacuation centers. Dante Amento, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Pump prices of fuel products will be adjusted anew this week. Oil firms announced today. In separate advisories, Filipina Shell Petroleum Corporation and Sea Oil Philippines Incorporated said they will roll back prices per liter of gasoline by 80 centavos, diesel by 85 centavos, and kerosene by 70 centavos a liter. Petrogas and Clean Fuel also said they will implement the same price changes. The oil price adjustment will take effect on Tuesday, November 3. This marks the second consecutive week of price reductions for diesel and kerosene. Other fuel firms have yet to announce price changes for this week. And for our weather update, Tropical Storm Raleigh maintains strength while moving westward over the West Philippine Sea. State Weather Bureau Pagasa says as of 3 p.m. today, Raleigh was estimated 225 kilometers west of Iba Zambales with maximum sustained winds of 65 kilometers per hour near the center and gustiness of up to 80 kilometers per hour while moving northwestward at 15 kilometers per hour. Areas under tropical cyclone wind signal number one are now lifted, but occasional gusts will be experienced over Batanes, Babuyan Group of Islands, Ilocos Region, Cordillera Administrative Region, and the northern portion of mainland Cagayan and Zambales. The trough of Raleigh will bring cloudy skies with scattered rain showers and thunderstorms over western Visayas, Zamboanga Peninsula, Zambales, Bataan, Oriental Mindoro, Palawan, Basilan, Sulu, and Tawi-Tawi. Raleigh is expected to exit the Philippine area of responsibility tomorrow morning and remain as tropical storm throughout the forecast period. However, according to Pag-asa, Raleigh may weaken into a tropical depression due to unfavorable conditions. Meanwhile, tropical storm Shawnee maintains strength as it accelerates west-northwestward over the Philippine Sea. 
Shawnee was located 665 kilometers east of Cagayan with the maximum sustained winds of 65 kilometers per hour near the center and gustiness of up to 80 kilometers per hour while moving northward at 25 kilometers per hour. The trough of Shawnee will bring cloudy skies with scattered rain showers and thunderstorms over Cagayan Valley, Apayao, Kalinga, and Ilocos Norte. Shawnee is likely to remain within tropical storm category within the next 36 to 48 hours. Meanwhile, Metro Manila and the rest of the country will experience partly cloudy to cloudy skies with isolated rain showers due to localized thunderstorms. And for the news abroad, here's Elsie Marcos reporting live from Auckland, New Zealand. With two days to go to the U.S. elections 2020, President Donald Trump cast doubt on the integrity of the off-mail-in ballots and the prolonged election vote count. Marie Peñaranya will tell us why. Nearly 60 million mail-in ballots have been casted in the U.S. elections that could take days or weeks to be counted in some states, meaning there is a possibility that a winner might not be declared in the hours after polls close on November 3 in the U.S. U.S. President Donald Trump once again cast doubt on the integrity of election, saying a prolonged vote count past Election Day would be a terrible thing and suggesting his lawyers might get involved. The president repeatedly without evidence said that mail-in votes are prone to be fraud, although mail voting is a long-standing feature of American elections and about one in four ballots was cast that way in 2016. Mail-in ballots are not the thing the president and his allies are trying to downplay in the 2020 election. In Texas, Republicans have lost one of two legal challenges they brought in the hope of halting drive through voting in Houston and having more than 120,000 votes thrown out. Texas, the second largest U.S. state, is a Republican stronghold, but latest polls show a close race between President Donald Trump and Democratic nominee Joe Biden, with more than 9 million ballots already casted easily dwarfing the state's 2016 turnout. A record-setting 92.2 million early votes have been cast either in person or by mail so far in this cycle, according to U.S. Elections Project, representing about 40% of eligible voters. Marie Peñaranda, UNTV News and Rescue, USA. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Two people have been taken to custody in West Auckland after a firearm was reportedly discharged. Joining us tonight is one of our correspondents in New Zealand, Ia De Vera, to tell us why live. Ia, how's the situation in the area? I'll see a lockdown at primary school in West Auckland has been lifted as police established the circumstances of an earlier incident in the neighborhood. School principal Alicia Burns of Lincoln Heights School confirmed that she received a phone call around midday and was advised by the police to be in lockdown as a safety precaution while police continue their operation. The incident is at Keegan Drive in Massey, Auckland, the same street where the school is located. Due to closeness of the firearm incident, all school staffs and students were inside their classrooms and doors and windows were locked. Members of the Armed Defender Squad has responded to the location, and two people were now taken into police custody. As of today, there are no reports of injury nor property damage. Parents have been notified of this situation through text messages and school's Facebook page. The school principal said that police did an amazing job to the point that they were totally unaware of what is happening. LC, it is the second time this year that the school had been into a lockdown situation after it was locked down in June caused by the shooting incident of a police officer which happened to be in a few hundred meters away. LC? Australia's lobster industry halts exports of lobsters to China as tons of the live shellfish are stranded at a Chinese airport. Marby Dolphin to tell us why live. 
Yes, Marvi. Elsie, commercial fishers across Australia have been advised to temporarily stop catching and exporting lobsters after tons of live products sit stranded at Chinese airports amid fears of escalating trade tensions. Chinese officials are still to provide clarifications and reasons for time delays at customs processing, which held up more than $100,000 worth of live South Australian rock lobsters for more than three days at Shanghai Pudong Airport after arriving on Thursday evening. The premium rock lobsters have been subject to increased import inspections and procedural changes over the past few days without warning, meaning Aussie exporters have faced a race against time to get them through Chinese customs and into restaurants and shops before they are spoiled. The expensive and high-demand seafood is unlikely to survive more than 48 hours, experts say. Australia's Trade Minister Simon Birmingham said it was important not to jump to conclusions over the lobster delay. Let us hear his statement from this morning. Uh, we do understand that a number of shipments uh, through a particular port of entry have faced delays as additional testing is undertaken for metal content levels within those, that seafood. Australia prides ourselves on being a high quality, safe exporter of premium product and we have absolute confidence that our industry meets the type of safety standards that are necessary into whatever market is that they are exporting. Trade Minister Birmingham added that all importers should be subjected to equivalent standards and there should be no discriminatory screening practices. So far as any industry concerns imply a breach of World Trade Organization or China-Australia Free Trade Agreement commitments, Chinese authorities should rule out the use of any such discriminatory actions. Elsie? Thank you, Marvi, for that report. Cybersecurity experts have warned of a marketing surveillance operations tied to QR code data collection in Australia. Maybe and Dog will tell us why live. Yes, Maeve. Elsie, QR code check-ins are meant to manage COVID check-in obligations of Australian businesses and assist the government's contact tracing efforts. But privacy experts raise their concerns over data exploitation, especially now that more businesses are about to reopen in the state of Victoria after the easing of restrictions. Earlier this year, tens of thousands of businesses rushed to outsource these platforms from private companies to collect customers' details but with no clear rules about how they store and use the data. Graham Greenleaf, Professor of Law and Information Systems at the University of New South Wales, argued that there is not enough attention given to the services of these private companies in the collection and use of Australians' information. He also explained that the information provided by customers are gold standard data that can be sold to external parties and overseas for marketing or used for identity fraud by cyber criminals. Meanwhile, the state and territory governments of New South Wales and Australian Capital Territory have issued mobile check-in applications, where their customers' data are securely stored with their official health departments, and not with the vendors or their QR code provider's database. Privacy experts also suggest that Australia should look at the United Kingdom's NHS QR code program and New Zealand's NZ Tracer app, where visitors will anonymously register to a location that they have visited. The encrypted information is stored locally on the person's device and can be accessed by health authorities, then issue a public alert when someone tests positive. Back to you, Elsie. Thank you, Maeve. And those are the reasons behind the new series in New Zealand and in other parts of the globe. Back to you, William. Thank you, Elsie Marcos, reporting live from Auckland, New Zealand. A team led by the University College of London, or UCL, has used a new kind of drone, leading to several findings on volcanoes that have been unexplored before. Nina Armilio tells us why. 
to enable communities better forecast future volcanic eruptions, specially adapted drones developed by a UCL-led international team have been gathering data from never-before-explored volcanoes. At Manam Volcano in Papua New Guinea, a cutting-edge research called The Above Project has been launched improving scientists' understanding of how volcanoes contribute to the global carbon cycle, key to sustaining life on Earth. The global carbon cycle refers to the exchanges of carbon within and between four major reservoirs, the atmosphere, the oceans, land, and fossil fuels. Co-author Professor Tobias Fischer of the University of New Mexico said that in order to understand the drivers of climate change, you need to understand the carbon cycle in the Earth. The team's findings, published in Science Advances, show for the first time how it is possible to combine measurements from the air, earth, and space to learn more about the most inaccessible, highly active volcanoes on the Earth. Specialists from the UK, the USA, Canada, Italy, Sweden, Germany, Costa Rica, New Zealand, and Papua New Guinea, spanning volcanology and aerospace engineering, have collaborated for the above project. They co-created solutions to the challenges of measuring gas emissions from active volcanoes through their modified long-range drones. With a diameter of 10 kilometers, Manam Volcano is located on an island 13 kilometers off the northeast coast of the mainland at 1,800 meters above sea level. Previous studies have shown it is among the world's biggest emitters of sulfur dioxide, but nothing was known of its carbon dioxide dioxide output. Volcanic CO2 emissions are challenging to measure due to high concentrations in the background atmosphere. Drones are the only way to obtain samples safely. Manam's last major eruptions between 2004 and 2006 devastated large parts of the island and displaced some 4,000 people to the mainland. Their crops destroyed and water supplies contaminated. Project lead Dr. Emma Liu of UCL Earth Sciences said that Manam hasn't been studied in detail, but they could see from satellite data that it was producing strong emissions. Co-author Professor Alessandro Ayupa of the University of Palermo described the findings as a real advance in their field. Adding that 10 years ago, you could have only stared and guessed what Manam's CO2 emissions were. But that has changed through the project's long-range drones. Nino Armilio, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. And those are the reasons behind the news, November 2, 2020. I am Harleen Delgado. Reasons we deliver to you as they unfold, I'm Angelo Castro III. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. I am William Theo, we serve the people, we give glory to God.